Warning, the following video contains really bad French pronunciation. If you don't like it, complain to Hannah's French teachers for not doing a better job. Hortense de Beauharnais, the first Queen of Holland. Daughter of an empress and deeply entangled with the Bonapartes. She was a queen that went on the run, was blacklisted for being extremely dangerous and seen as a terrorist threat. Mother of the future emperor of the French, Napoleon III, and his illegitimate brother, the Duke of Morny, which also means, as you might have guessed, that she was an adulteress. It's fair to say that the life of Hortense de Beauharnais was far from boring. Hortense Bonaparte, or Hortense de Beauharnais, whatever you prefer, was born Hortense Eugenie Cecil de Beauharnais on the 10th of April 1783. Her birth was a premature one, and her mother Rose de Beauharnais gave birth to little Hortense on her own in Paris. This was not because she was early. Her father, Alexander de Beauharnais, was abroad in the French colonies, and he is convinced, or he convinces himself, that Hortense is not his biological child. Hortense was Rose and Alexander's second child, and she had an older brother, Eugene, with whom she would share a close bond with. At the age of two on the 5th of March 1785, Hortense's parents separated. The custody of their children was split. Rose had Hortense, and Alexander had Eugene. Her parents' separation would go on to impact her view on marriage quite negatively, and she came to recognise separation as a normal state for a relationship. Her parents had never had the best relationship, and therefore Hortense had never been given an example of a loving relationship, until her mother married Napoleon, and even that is problematic. In 1788, when Hortense was five years old, her mother Rose took Hortense to visit her grandmother in Martinique. Hortense would reflect fondly on her memories in Martinique. She enjoyed running around in bare feet, dancing and singing. Hortense would refer back to her life in Martinique frequently in her memoirs. By 1790, the effects of the French Revolution were being felt in Martinique. What with that and the slaves' revolt, Rose felt that it was necessary for her and Hortense to return to Paris. Unfortunately for Hortense, her father Alexander was a victim of the French Revolution. He was imprisoned and eventually guillotined on the 23rd of July 1794. Her mother Rose was also arrested. However, she was released from prison on the 28th of July 1794. During this time, Hortense and her brother Eugene would wander around Paris. Upon her release, Josephine's new goal was to rebuild her life and social status. As a result, Josephine deemed herself to be too busy to bring up children, so she sent Hortense to a boarding school in the summer of 1795. Hortense was sent to the Institution Nationale de Saint-Germain, a girls' school founded by Marie Antoinette's former lady-in-waiting, Madame Campin. Hortense would flourish here. She learnt all the skills a young aristocratic lady would need, including music, dance, drama and painting and she earned awards such as the cleverest child and the bravest child at school. Madame Campin would remark, She is the most delightful girl of 12 years old that I have ever had to teach. Hortense also made a close network of friends, including Madame Campin, but also Adèle Augui, a close confidant and the future Madame de Brock, Eliza Monroe, daughter of the future US President James Monroe, and apparently Caroline Bonaparte, her future sister-in-law. However, I'm not too sure how true that last one is. Also a student there was Hortense's cousin, Emily de Bourne. Hortense's mother Rose, or Josephine, wed Napoleon Bonaparte on the 9th of March, 1796. Rose and Napoleon had only known each other for five months prior to the wedding, and Hortense had first met her stepfather at a family dinner. Despite the fact that there was no chance of her parents getting back together, you know, on account that Alexander was dead and headless, Hortense was not happy with her mother. She was actually quite angry with Josephine marrying Napoleon. I have two theories about this, either because she felt that she was trying to replace her father with Napoleon, or she wasn't happy with how quickly that they were getting married, 
considering they hardly knew each other. At first, both siblings, Hortense and Eugene, were distrustful and reserved about their new stepfather. But that soon changed to admiration, and as we will see, Hortense will become one of Napoleon's biggest supporters. In her memoirs, Hortense wrote that Napoleon was very affectionate towards her and Eugene, and that he received with all the affection of a father. But, as her mother had failed to provide Napoleon an heir, her position was vulnerable, and, in order to save her own relationship from sinking, Rose, or Josephine, proposed a marriage between Hortense and Napoleon's younger brother, Louis, to provide the Bonaparte Borne heir that Josephine could not provide. Hortense was shocked. She didn't want to get married to Louis. She was in love with Duroc, and she didn't particularly like Louis. He was gloomy and a bit of a hypochondriac. Josephine put pressure on her daughter to marry Louis, and as we know, even as a little girl, Hortense only wanted to please her mother. So, reluctantly, she agreed. Louis also didn't want to marry Hortense, but after pressure from his brother, he too agreed. Hortense and Louis Bonaparte were wed on the 4th of January 1802. The wedding was miserable, as neither party really wanted to be there. Hortense may have been reluctant in marrying Louis, but that didn't stop her from performing her duty, as nine months later, on the 10th of October 1802, the couple welcomed their first child, Napoleon Louis Charles Bonaparte. They welcomed their second child, Napoleon Louis Bonaparte, in 1804. Hortense and her husband, Louis, were also present at the coronation of Napoleon and Josephine on the 2nd of December 1804, which was held at Notre Dame Cathedral. Hortense wore a dress that was studded with diamonds and watched the grand ceremony with her eldest child, Louis Charles, who held her hand throughout. Napoleon was not shy at handing out titles to his family, and his brother and stepdaughter were no exception. On the 5th of June 1806, Emperor Napoleon made Louis and Hortense the King and Queen of Holland. Hortense was not happy about this, as she didn't want to leave France. She wrote to her brother Eugene, bewildered by the fact that she might actually have to go to Holland, the country she's been given the title of Queen for. I mean, how ungrateful! If somebody offered me a queenship, I'll take it. I mean, they don't exactly advertise those jobs on LinkedIn. Hortense wrote to Eugene, Do you really think they're going to send us to Holland? I cannot think of it without bringing tears to my eyes. My God, I will die of grief of it. This is awkward. Despite her complaining, Hortense and Louis arrived in The Hague in Holland on the 18th of June with their two sons in the carriage. Louis, like his brother Napoleon, hated the fact that his wife was as popular if not more so than himself. When they moved over to Holland, Hortense started introducing a lot of French culture, presumably because she was a bit homesick and because she liked it. She brought with her French culture such as fashion and decorations. Also like his brother, Louis had trust issues and had his wife spied on, had her letters opened and he forbid her to dance. As we saw earlier, Music and the arts have always been a keen interest for Hortense, so when Louis banned dancing and then told her that she wasn't allowed to sing or play the piano in public, I can imagine she was heartbroken. And very quickly, life for Hortense became bland. She may be Queen of Holland, but she was a prisoner in her apartments. And just to rub salt in the wound, Louis started to spread rumours about Hortense's love life, which tarnished her reputation. He then demanded that she no longer accompany him in the festivities. For me personally, I think this was all so he could enjoy the spotlight by himself. And I think the lack of respect for Hortense as a wife and stepniece, gross, and a woman and as a person just shows but let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. However, despite all of this, Hortense appreciated, but nevertheless surprised, at how warmly the Dutch welcomed her, and quickly became accustomed to life in the Netherlands. 
she came to love the country. She would visit the marketplaces and, like her mother, spend lots of money. Prior to her husband banning her, she would attend official celebrations and ceremonies and she would make herself accessible to her subjects, which is probably why she was adored so much. She learned watercolour painting and made trips around the countryside. I don't think it was a secret to anyone that, despite having two children, the royal marriage was in tatters, to the point that Napoleon intervenes by writing to the pair of them. Now, I'm not making Hortense out to be the victim, because by all accounts, Louis was a difficult person to live with, but she does nothing to help herself. Louis would suffer several seizures a day, so he would frequent spa towns to help his condition, although this isn't a cure by any means. As we alluded to earlier, he does have a jealousy issue, but he was very intelligent and a bit sensitive. Hortense made no effort to comfort or reassure her husband, and in his letter that he wrote on the 2nd of May, 1807, Napoleon told his brother, you have an excellent wife and you make her unhappy. Fix it. He equally reminded Hortense that Louis may have some unusual ideas, but Louis is just a man. The couple would briefly reconcile, but not under happy circumstances. Their eldest son, Napoleon Louis Charles Bonaparte, died of croup on the 5th of May, 1807. Hortense was at her son's bedside. She was devastated over the loss of her son. Hortense went back to France to be with her mother. Louis, who was still being pressured by Napoleon to try and save his marriage, also went to France. This time in France did their relationship some good, as after this encounter, Hortense became pregnant with baby number three. But Louis became paranoid and convinced himself that his baby was not his. Why do I feel there are just so many similarities between Hortense's life and her mother's life at this point? They almost feel parallel. Rumours were being spread back in Holland that Admiral Charles Joseph Comte de Flo was the baby's father, not Louis. Which I know the two had an affair, um, and they will go on to have an illegitimate child, but at this particular circumstance, it's just utterly ridiculous because they were nowhere near each other. Hortense was allowed to stay in France as the climate was supposed to be better for raising her son, Louis Napoleon. While in France, Hortense enjoyed her status as a queen at the French court, which lasted until 1810, when her stepfather Napoleon remarried to Marie-Louise of Austria. The baby finally arrived on the 20th of April 1808, and he was named Charles-Louis Napoleon Bonaparte. This particular child would go on to be known by another name, Napoleon III. Hortense returned to Utrecht in 1810 with much reluctance. She was not happy with the smell and thought that the women of Utrecht were ugly. Update mum's daughter say what? That Hortense's words, not mine. A lot has happened to Hortense at this point. She's grieving for the loss of her eldest. Her mother and stepfather are getting a divorce. She can't get divorced. And she's being accused of being an adulteress. And her youngest son's legitimacy is being called into question by his own father. So when she returned to Holland, her subjects noted how ill and weak she looked. Our poor queen, she's so miserable. It got so bad that a few weeks later, it was thought that she would die from this mystery illness but she doesn't, spoiler alert. Her appearance was also noted on. She returned to Holland looking very pious. Her image did not match the rumours that were going round, but as mentioned earlier, she was still deeply mourning the loss of her son, and as many people do, she turned to religion, and it was her faith that kept her going during this dark time. In the summer of 1810, after battling a potential life-threatening illness, she asked her husband Louis if she could return to France, because as I said earlier, it was thought that the climate was better in France, and she probably just wanted her mummy. Surprisingly, Louis agreed, but their son, Napoleon Louis Bonaparte, who was now five, would have to stay, as he was the heir to the throne. Hortense would never see her adoptive homeland again. Within a month, Louis abdicated, 
and their son, Napoleon Louis, succeeded his father for two weeks, although some sources say even less than that, after which the entire Dutch Bonaparte family had to flee Holland and return to Paris. On the 20th of March, 1811, Empress Marie Louise gave birth to the heir of the French Empire, Napoleon, the King of Rome. The son of the emperor was baptised on the 9th of June, 1811, at Notre Dame Cathedral. Hortense was in attendance at the baptism and had the honour of godmother, which she shared with Napoleon's mother, Leticia, Madame Mère. Okay, I don't know how true this next bit is, but apparently at around this time there was a bit of a love triangle between Hortense, Caroline Bonaparte and Charles de Fleur, and both women were vying for his attention. Now, I know the two women both had affairs with him, but what I don't know is how competitive they were about it, or even if their affairs overlapped. From what I can gather, Caroline had her affair with Charles quite a bit earlier. But if I'm being completely honest, I wasn't really too fussed about researching the affair. I was actually focusing more on Hortense herself. So the fact that I've just mentioned it, there you go. Apparently, Caroline did try to damage the budding relationship, but to no avail. And Hortense and Charles went from courteous to passionate. Either way, Hortense had been seeing Charles for at least nine months because in September 1811, she secretly gave birth to an illegitimate child. <laughs> you what? Charles Auguste Louis Joseph in Switzerland. Charles was the father and only her brother Eugene, de Fleur's mother who would go on to raise the child and Hortense's closest companions were aware of the pregnancy. Hortense was forced to keep the birth a secret to avoid scandal. The success of her being able to avoid scandal reveals how much Hortense was able to trust her entourage. Hortense had used the excuse of poor health to explain her prolonged visit to Switzerland, where Charles's mother, Adelaide Philou de Souza, had arranged. On the 29th of March 1814, things were getting a little bit squeaky bum time in Paris, as the collapse of Napoleon's reign seemed to be imminent. Louis Bonaparte demanded that Hortense come to him for safety, but she ignored him and went to her mother, Josephine. In hindsight, you could say that actually, she was fleeing her husband, not the situation. Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte was forced to abdicate on the 6th of April 1814 and goes into exile in Elba. King Louis XVIII would be the next ruler of France, However, his reign would not start until the 3rd of May. So, during this time, Tsar Alexander I of Russia, who had invaded France, was in charge until Louis arrived. The Tsar led a prayer ceremony on the spot where fellow monarch King Louis XVI had been executed, and a tidum was jointly conducted. While in Paris, Alexander frequently visited Josephine and Hortense. He had taken a liking to both women and he considered advocating for Hortense and her children in Holland, which greatly confused Hortense. She wrote, My only support left is an enemy. During her visits, Alexander would take her young children on his lap. When King Louis XVIII finally arrived in Paris, before handing over the power, Alexander was able to secure Hortense the Duchy of St. Lou, making her the Duchess of St. Lou on the 30th of May 1814, much the reluctancy of the new king. But this was bittersweet for Hortense, as her mother Josephine had died just the day before, at the age of 51. So maybe this gift from Alexander was to protect Hortense, now that she had no parents left, as both Alexander, her father, and Josephine were dead. And Napoleon, well, he was as useful as a chocolate teapot from a certain point of view. Or it could have been just to cheer her up. Pretty much as soon as the Russians left France, Napoleon seized the opportunity to make a comeback and recapture his imperial throne. Napoleon returned to Paris on the 20th of March, 1815, to cheering crowds. King Louis XVIII fled and Napoleon began what would be known as his 100 days. On his return from Elba, 
Napoleon initially received Hortense coldly, but he pardoned her. However, Tsar Alexander and many of the other European monarchs would see Hortense's support of her stepfather as a betrayal. Yet when Napoleon came back to France for those 100 days, nothing was the same. Marie-Louise was in Austria with their son, not speaking to him, and Josephine had died. Contrary to the Tsar's advice, it was Hortense who stood by her stepfather, slash brother-in-law, like an empress. Hortense and Eugene both supported Napoleon. Napoleon's return initially started well, but then he suffered defeat at the hands of the British at the Battle of Waterloo. Stop it. On the 18th of June, 1815, he was forced to abdicate again four days later on the 22nd of June, 1815. Napoleon did try to flee to America, but he was captured by the English and sent to St Helena. This time it was the British and the Prussians who ruled France until King Louis XVIII returned to France on the 8th of July, 1815. On the 17th of July, 1815, Hortense was informed that she had to leave the city of Paris within a couple of hours. She was accompanied by Count Édouard de Wona and Carl Philippe, Prince of Schwarzenberg, who were there to mainly keep an eye on her. Hortense was nearly arrested twice, thankfully that was avoided with the help of Carl Philippe, and it was only now that Hortense understood the severity of her situation. She wrote, Enemies taking my part, Frenchmen acting as my foes, for the pleasure of persecuting me, they had placed themselves in a humiliating position and allowed themselves to be reminded that they had to be defeated. And now Hortense was on the run. Hortense was homeless, not in the situation that she had nowhere to live. I mean, she is still a former queen and an imperial princess, but she doesn't belong anywhere. France don't want her, and she didn't want to return to the Netherlands, having remarked, I ruled there once. Hortense was seen as a danger, and it was thought that she and everyone else would be safe if she was in one of the four main ally states, Britain, Austria, Prussia or Russia, where they can keep an eye on her. But Hortense refused. She would spend the next few years roaming around Europe. Hortense was forced to have a passport so that her movements across Europe could be tracked. She was also placed on the blacklist, which also featured the terrorists that voted for the murder of King Louis XVI and radical revolutionaries and all of the members of the Bonaparte family as they had been exiled. So as you can see, this single mother of two is being viewed as a very serious international threat. All of Bonaparte's family were exiled, and like Hortense, they could only live in one of the four major allied countries. The other Bonapartes also had to have a passport, and it stated on their passports that they were on the blacklist. In January 1817, Hortense bought a small country house at Arenberg, Switzerland, which would become a hotbed for revolution and artistic creation. Hortense also used her jewels and wealth to help fund revolutionaries or Bonapartists who wanted the Bonaparte family back on the throne in France. This small chateau entertained writers, philosophers and Bonaparte royalists. And it would be at this little chateau that Hortense began to write her memoirs as a way of expressing her life in her own words and being remembered her way, which is quite remarkable for a woman of her time. While here she indulged herself in all the pastimes that she enjoyed, but Louis had banned, such as singing, dancing and composing music. She even drew and painted here. And she had many famous guests at the chateau, which included the poet Lord Byron. Underneath this innocence, a resistance was growing. She kept the spirit of resistance against the restoration regime alive. She raised her sons to be staunch Bonapartists. In 1825, Napoleon Louis, Hortense's eldest surviving son, was living in Italy with the rest of the Bonaparte's family. He wed a year later, on the 24th of July, 1826, in Florence, to his first cousin, 
Charlotte Bonaparte. Gross. Napoleon's will said that he wanted his nieces and nephews to marry amongst themselves to conserve the Bonaparte wealth. Charlotte Bonaparte was the daughter of Napoleon's older brother, Joseph. This union did not provide any children, probably for the best. And Napoleon Louis was two years younger than his wife. And at first, Charlotte found him rather immature and humorless. But they grew to, I don't want to say love each other, um, they grew to get along. On the 17th of March 1831, Napoleon Louis Bonaparte died while fighting for the rebel group that was trying to drive the Austrians out of Italy. His official cause of death was measles, but he potentially might have taken a bullet. Napoleon Louis died at the age of 26 in his brother Charles Louis's arms. Hortense must have been devastated at losing another son, but she held strong and met with her son Charles, and together they travelled incognito to Paris. They arrived in Paris in the April. Hortense, keeping a low profile, contacted the new king of the French, Louis-Philippe, asking for passports so that she could go to England with her son. Remember, Hortense had a passport, but hers said that she was on the blacklist, so she needed another one if she wanted to travel safely. Mother and son were warmly welcomed at Tullier's palace, and he agreed to getting her the new passports. King Louis-Philippe was more liberal than the old Bourbons. Rumour of Hortense's presence in Paris began to spread, and on the 5th of May, a large crowd gathered, shouting, Vive l'Empereur! Live the Emperor! The next day, Hortense and Charles were ordered to leave, so they took their passports and went to England. In 1837, Hortense fell ill, while Charles Louis was in the US. He managed to return to Arenberg just in time to be of his mother, who died of uterine cancer on the 5th of August at the age of 54. Hortense would never get to see her son become Emperor Napoleon III, and she was buried at the saint pierre et saint paul church with her mother Josephine in 1838. Charles Louis did not attend his mother's funeral, and the Dutch newspapers only dedicated three lines to the death and funeral of their first queen. Charles Louis became Emperor Napoleon III on the 2nd of December 1852. He chose his favourite song that his mother had composed, Partons pour la Souris, as the national anthem. Hortense had lost two sons. She raised the other one to be an emperor. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give this video a like, make sure to subscribe and share this video with a friend. If you haven't already, make sure to check out my other Napoleon content. I've got Napoleon himself, Hortense's mother Josephine, Empress Marie Louise, and a video on what the two women thought of each other. So if you haven't already, go check it out. But until the next time, have a wonderful day.